You could say that I am a child of my time. Having no siblings is the new normal, in a world where we are not having children the way we used to. This was the world 120 years ago, before the First World War and the Russian Revolution, and the first right flying, before prohibition in the US and before women's right to vote in close to all nations. In a poor world, the fertility rate was high across the board. The global average was 5.5 children born for every adult woman, and most nations are painted in green and yellow. A higher stack of markers indicate more children, one marker per child. The colors help to see the overall trend, with red indicating over 8 children born per woman. A few nations fall into that category. Then we have orange nations above 7, yellow above 6, dark green above 5 and light green above 4. Some nations are already now in the blue. Light blue indicates a fertility rate above 3. And one single nation, France, is marked in dark blue, with a fertility rate above 2. 2.8 to be precise. Starting in 1900, the changes are small to begin with. The fertility rates are high all over the world, but they have been going down in most European nations during the 1800s. In Europe, the nations are marked in mainly green and more and more blue, indicating a drop from four or five children to three or four, by the time of World War II. In the Americas and Asia, it is a mixed picture, where green nations are joined by many yellow nations, with six children on average, or even orange above seven. Africa has a slightly higher level on average, with most nations in yellow. Only occasionally does a nation pop up above eight children and is marked in red. Many nations had a drop during the war and a following bounce back up in the decades after. But from the 1960s and forward, the drop is significant in Europe. Many nations are by the 1980s marked in purple, with a fertility rate below two. By the 2000s, that is true for close to all European nations. In Africa, not much is happening with the levels up until the 1990s, when the development is fast in many nations on the continent. By the 2000s and 2010s, almost no nations are left in yellow. Most are in green, and a significant bunch down in blue, with three babies per woman. In the Americas, the shift is except for the US and Canada, who were down in blue before most European nations, mainly happening in the 1980s and 90s. The decline was fast in many nations, and now the whole continent is painted in purple and blue, almost down to the levels of Europe. In Asia, the population powerhouse of the 20th century, the development is similar, with some of the large nations in the east seeing a remarkably fast decline in just a decade or so. By the 2000s, almost all nations were down in blue or purple territory. At just a couple of times, Hong Kong and Taiwan is down below one. And finally, in Oceania, New Zealand and Australia stand out, with, much like the US and Canada, having a lower rate than Europe in the first part of the 20th century. For the island nations in the Pacific Ocean, the development is more closely similar to the Asian nations, with a sharp drop from the 1980s and onwards. Today, most have a fertility rate between three or four children per woman. The fertility rate is, not surprisingly, alongside the death rate, the main basis for population projections. And the global reduction in fertility rate we have seen during the last century is the reason why the annual growth rate of the human population peaked in the 1960s. The main reason why the number of humans on Earth is still increasing, and will continue to do so in the coming decades, is that there are more humans alive now to have children. So what is driving fertility rate? Several factors impact how many children a woman chooses to have, and here we will focus on the societal level. First of all, it is important to point out that correlation is tricky, and it is easy to draw conclusions based on common, known facts, and not question if there really is a strong correlation. If it is true for all places and times, or if there really is a much more important common reason for the factors correlating. People who drink more champagne have fewer children in their lifetime, but that is not the result of champagne having a negative effect on the sperm count, it is a result of them both having a common origin. 
wealth. Richer people tend to drink more champagne on average, and richer people tend to have fewer children. These kinds of correlations that have a common factor that explains them both is called a spurious relationship. But wealth is a good factor to start with. The most common explanation for why people choose to have many children is poverty and the poor health that comes with it. In nations with high child mortality, the fertility rates tend to be higher. Two concepts with quite a bad mouthfeel, child replacement and child hoarding, are commonly known to drive the number of children a woman chooses to have. In poorer nations, children are important for labor in the household, not the least to work in family agriculture. And if the children run a high risk of not surviving to adulthood, people choose to have more children. Even if this means the family has less resources to allocate to every individual child. Even though this might feel a bit heartless for someone living in a high income nation with low fertility rate, this is the reality for people in the few nations today that are plagued by a high child mortality. And it was the reality in whatever nation you live in not that many generations ago. It does not take away the utter tragedy that losing a child is for every family affected by it. The reduction in child labor is a significant factor that has driven the fertility rate down. With wealth, children are less useful as labor, since less of the labor is made up of manual, simple, physical tasks. And when children have the opportunity to go to school, and might even be forced by law to attend school for a certain number of years, the economic incentives for the family to have children is shifted, to children actually being more of a cost. Of course, there are direct costs in the form of food, amenities and school fees, but also the cost of the time and energy allocated by mainly the mother in pregnancy, childbirth and raising the child. Another common perception is that parent chooses to have children for economic and social support when reaching old age, but this is not supported to the same extent in research. One factor that is extensively studied and quite reliably correlated to a reduction in fertility rate is the education level of the mother. An educated woman chooses to have significantly fewer children. There are many explanations as to why, but one relating to what we already talked about is that the cost of having a child that emerges with economic development and educational opportunities for the child is greater if the woman is educated and is working outside the home. Her time is, in more ways than one, worth more money, when childbearing could impact her career and salary negatively. Educated women also care for their children with more knowledge of health and nutrition. This means the child has a higher chance of staying healthy. Here we can point to urbanization being a possible common explanation for them both. Living in an urban environment often means closeness both to schools and hospitals. That is not to say that living in slums in the outskirts of urban environments necessarily means a greater health compared to rural living. Education also results in a higher participation in the labor force and in general to women's empowerment within families as well as in communities. When economies grow, women's labor are increasing in value, not only because more workforce is needed, but also because the work shifts away from physically demanding tasks where men have an advantage to intellectual work where women are overrepresented at universities around the world. Many nations also go through a process where fields of work previously only open to men become available to women as well. With an increased equality, women chooses to have fewer children overall, to wait longer with getting married and having her first child, and spaces pregnancies further apart. Another positive impact of education is the awareness of sexual health and contraceptives. Still today, population in parts of the world is lacking in access to contraceptives and is therefore vulnerable to unwanted pregnancies as well as STGs. Access to legal and safe abortions can also help contribute to a decline in the fertility rate, even though an arguably more important reason for is to reduce the practice of unsafe abortions, putting the woman at risk for complications. Education often spurs changes in social norms. When the concept that fewer children might be better for the family and the community gains traction, the development is hard to stop and can be very fast. Nobel Prize laureate Amartya Sen points to this factor in his study of India at a state-by-state -state level. How cultural and religious aspects is impacting the fertility rate could help explain why the rate is falling faster in some nations than others. 
Here, research make a much clearer connection between culture and fertility rate, rather than between religion and fertility rate. Levels vary more between nations with the different demographics than it does between different religious groupings within nations. Religious teaching does in many places include a notion that having many children is a positive thing, but in, for example, the European context, the more religious nations have lower fertility rate, like Italy, Portugal and Poland, than more secularized nations, like France and the Scandinavian nations. And this is probably because, with economic development, fertility rates go down to a certain level, and then it once again increases a little. With highly developed economies and a specialized labor market, women are freer to choose to have children without it having as much of an impact on her career and income. These nations also often have a large social welfare system with affordable childcare and extensive parental leave policies. With policy changes like that, nations can increase their fertility rate slightly to at least close to the level of replacement. China is an interesting example here with its policies throughout the last decades. China is one of the nations that has had the most drastic decline in fertility rate ever, basically dropping in half from six to three babies per woman in just seven or eight years. I have talked about this development before, but this all happened before the one-child policy was enforced. And now, when China is facing a falling population, the question is if the incentives the Communist Party is giving to families will be enough to increase the fertility rate. Because, like mentioned, once a culture is one of small families, and even a majority of the children having no siblings, the trend can be very hard to change. In other parts of the world, the introduction of television, and especially TV series and soap operas with female protagonists. In most shows, these women have no or few children, and they more often focus on a high-paced working life in the city, rather than the dream of a big family and a stay-home parent lifestyle. Studies show a significant correlation between the introduction of, for example, telenovelas in South America and the reduction in fertility. Television brought a worldview and lifestyle to smaller cities and rural communities that valued new aspects of life outside the family. So what does the projection say about the fertility rates in the future? Well, it shouldn't be a surprise, based on all we have talked about here, that they will continue on the decline. Using the Gapminder Foundation's projections, we can see the fertility rate change over the coming decades, based on the best available demographic data we have. In most parts of the world, the rate is already low, and not much visible change on the scale used here will happen in the coming decades. The change is more noticeable in Africa, where close to all nations are down in blue in a couple of decades, and then more and more drop down to purple. In the Americas, the few nations that are in the blue today are down in purple in the coming decades. And the same holds true for the most Asian nations, that today have a fertility rate around 2.5 or 3. And by the end of the century, the world is less of a color explosion than it was 200 years earlier. But it is a world where close to all children survive to adulthood, and where families can put their resources into fewer children and invest in their development and education. I have other videos on my channel covering different aspects of development. You can check them out if you're interested. Thank you so much for watching.